Well, good morning. Today we're going to be talking in our lecture about the patriarchs. The title of our message is The Story Before the Story. The Story Before the Story. The Bible says that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the wisdom of kings to search it out. This means that God's providential plan from the beginning of the ages has been known to his mind and to his counsel and to himself. And the Bible says that God shall do nothing unless he reveal himself to his holy prophets. So God's plan in part has been, has been revealed and declared from the very beginning. And yet many times it's hidden in what we would call types, foreshadowings, and uh, allusions to the story to come. You'll see this throughout the entire biblical narrative, especially if you read the Bible through chronologically, you will see God telling the story before the story comes to pass. He ta always tells the story before the story. So, let's take one of the first instances of our patriarchs in the Old Testament narrative. Now, many scholars won't consider this man a, a patriarch, but I like to consider him a prototype of a patriarch. Now, a prototype is like the first rendition. And let us look at at the story of Job. And so Job in the Bible is very, very interesting because the Bible calls Job a just man, a perfect man. And it says that Job feared God. And yet great calamity came to Job. He was tempted and tested and trialed. The enemy attacked him. He lost his household, his family, his health. He, he lost his wealth. Everything physically went wrong. And all of his friends are there giving him horrible, horrible, horrible advice. And that's how you have to be very careful when you read the book of Job. Because a lot of people go, well, you know, it's, it, this statement's in the Bible. And they don't necessarily know that it's coming from the mouth of Job's friends. And so they get in trouble because they pull a verse out of its context of its story. But what we're looking at overall is just the concept of a just man, a righteous man, a good man who feared God. And the enemy can stand anything except for a just man, a righteous man, a good man who fears God. And so the enemy, the enemy attacks, but yet God has this confidence in his friend Job. And so the story is that from the very beginning, goodness prevails over evil. Righteousness wins. That Job didn't cry out and curse God. He didn't choose selfishly. But he trusted God even amidst the onslaught of the enemy, even through trial and temptation, even through great loss, even through great trouble. Job went through the trouble and never cursed God and his faith in God remained. So much so that one of the greatest Old Testament statements, one of the greatest Old Testament statements about the resurrection came from the story of the book of Job. Job says in a great moment of faith, I know that in my flesh I will see God. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. This is, friends, the story before the story. I want you to also know that there is a great correlation between the ministry of Job and the ministry of Jesus. Let me explain this very carefully. The statements in question that Job makes to God. 
you notice in the passage, God doesn't answer them in the book of Job. God immediately comes with over 30 questions to Job. He's like, you're going to question me? Uh, brace yourself and stand like a man. I will question you. Where were you when the foundations were laid? Where were you when I hang the moon and the stars? You know, he just goes through the whole list of questions. But here, have you ever done a study to see how Jesus of Nazareth, who is God in the flesh, single-handedly answers every question that Job asked? Now, I'll leave that to you because it's an incredible study, and I won't rob you from all the nuggets. You know, I don't want to do that. Because many times, you know, sermons that uh, preachers, when they preach their sermons, they don't leave any marshmallows in the bowl of Lucky Charms. And I, I want to, you to have your own delicious bowl of Lucky Charms. And maybe I'm talking about Lucky Charms because I've been on keto for a couple of months. But, but don't do that to people. Don't always give all of the instruction. Allow them to, to delve into the Word of God th themselves for you know, scribes of the kingdom bring forth treasure, both new and old. But Job is a prototype of the story before the story of righteousness winning, the of, of a, a godly man being vindicated, and of the great resurrection, and of the enemy losing, and about the difference between uh, ultimate loss and, and material and earthly loss. See, uh, remember, oh, I'll give you one. No man who leaves his father and mother or, or, or loses son and daughter will not receive a hundredfold both in this life and in the next. You have to understand Jesus answers the great questions of Job. But it's the story before the story. He's the prototype of the patriarchs. Now, when we say patriarch, what do we mean? It comes from the word patre, which means father, you know, our father. You, you probably, some of you maybe with ecclesiastical backgrounds or Lutheran or Catholic backgrounds know the, the Pater Noster. They know the Our Father prayer. So we know in Latin, uh, Patre means father. And Arche is law. So father, law. Patriarch means the, the law of the father, the rule of law. Of, it goes to, to the dad, to the, the, the patriarch, to the ruling elder of the family unit and so we, we move from job to to our next patriarch in the bible uh, and the next story before the story the story of noah now once again once again god says an incredible statement about another man that noah was a just man perfect in his generation that word there for perfect is tamim it, it literally means uh, unblemished, without uh, a blemish or without any defilement. It's, 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 it speaks about purity. It's the same word in description of the lambs. You know, we're to give, in the Old Testament, they were to give offerings of lambs and sheep as for atonement. We know the concept in, in the Old Testament of, of, of a sacrifice on the day of Yom Kippur for atonement. But they were to be unblemished lambs tamim lambs and, and so this is where describing noah and his and his generations that his line his lineage was pure and undefiled and no noah, noah was a patriarch and the verse you read the verse you've memorized when god saw the wickedness of man that every intention, motivation, every thought, every imagination, every dream and fantasy of man, every, every waking moment of man's heart at that time was evil continually. It says that God was grieved. And he repented that he made man. Now, word there for grieved literally means to gasp, to take one's breath away. When God saw... When God saw the, the horrors of sin and the travesty of so much selfishness and compounded rebellion, it says that God was grieved that his breath was taken away. 
most people have a view of God in which God cannot feel pain. It is a wrong view of God. My theological mentor, Winky Prattney, taught me that it is the grief of God which is the great basis and motive for evangelism and missions. The grief of God. That if we could do something to alleviate God's pain over the lost world, it is within our moral obligation to do so. Just in the same way, if you knew something was a great grief to your father or your mother or your, or your brother. If you had any type of affection towards an individual and you knew there was something causing them pain, you are motivated to act. But people, and unfortunately even modern theologians, they paint a God, they describe a God who is not grieved, that is so distant and removed from man that he doesn't display any type of emotions because they say, oh, if God displays emotions, then God changes and therefore he's not perfect. No. We are empathetic. We as humans display emotion. We're made in the image and likeness of God. So Noah is in this situation a righteous and just man in the whole world is under the sway of evil and selfishness and rebellion. But the most incredible statement, I think, in Genesis is this. But Noah found grace and favor in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Out of all the men on the earth, Noah found favor and grace in the eyes of the Lord. That amidst God would have been 100% within his right to execute judgment on a lost world. But the kindness and grace of God. The kindness and grace of God instructed Noah to, to, to operate and build an ark a boat to save mankind. And by one man's righteous obedience to the direction of God, mankind was saved. God always tells the story before the story. So God instructs Noah to build an ark. And, and he did. Now there's a, you have to understand it wasn't just a quick, you know, run to Home Depot and putting a couple of boards together. This took a long amount of time. And the, the, the duration of time that it took was a indicator of the forbearance and patience of God. That the whole time Noah is building, he's also consequently, we learn from the New Testament, doing what? Anyone? We learn from the New Testament that Noah is a preacher of righteousness. So Noah is building and preaching. Building and preaching. This continues for years. And he's warning the people to repent and return to God. And only eight people make it onto the ark only eight people are saved the bible says that noah was moved with holy fear as he built the ark we we have to understand that sometimes sometimes we can get too caught up with the numbers some, we count these numbers, we count these numbers. There's only eight people on the ark. 
Only eight people were obedient and listened to the warnings of the preacher of righteousness. And we need to be less, less prideful in, in our counting and more confident on getting people onto the ark. Jesus makes an incredible statement. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the days of Christ's coming. The days of Noah is that every man's heart was evil continually, and it grieved the Lord that he had made man. 70% of the internet is pornographic. The, that means the, ma the majority of communication through telecommunication devices is, 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 is iniquity to God. You have to understand that we are moving categorically close to a time when God will judge the earth again. Not in water, but in holy fire. And so in this time, we need to learn the lesson of Noah who as a preacher of righteousness warned the people to get onto the ark. We have to understand the exclusivity of the ark. There's only one door on the whole ship. There's only one way into safety. Christ tells us once again, I am the door. These are types, foreshadowings. This saying there's only one way to escape the wrath and judgment that is coming. Get onto the ark. And also, God instructs Noah to cover the ark with pitch, with tar. He tells Noah to cover the ark with tar. And we learn from more studies that in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for pitch is the same word the Hebrews use for atonement. Atonement. That God and man could be at one together again through a sacrifice. So ba basically the, the shadows, the story before the story is there's only one way in. And only through a, the sacrifice will you be saved from the judgment. It's the story before the story. And the lesson for us today in our context as when we see the dark storm clouds of judgment approaching, we have to get everybody on the ark. Now is not a time for literary devices. It's not a time for much words. It's a time for simplicity and our gospel communications. I'm reminded of the evangelist Charles Grandison Finney and his instructions to people on the conversion of the lost. His instructions are very clear. You speak to lost people as if they were in a fire and they could not see their way through a burning building. You don't say, hey, if you have time, perhaps maybe if you weren't doing anything later, could you move to your left three spaces and then go down the hallway? And then, you know, if you feel like going to the right, go to the right. How do you communicate to someone who's in a burning building and who the smoke obscures their walk? You speak directly, loudly, clearly. Move to the right. Take a left turn. And so if we claim to have the clarity of understanding, then we should speak simply, clearly, and directly. But we have to speak because people are in peril. I believe the day is approaching. We must learn the lesson of Noah. We must learn that. We must put all of our hope and trust in the ark of God, which is Jesus Christ the Lord. And that his atonement is the only way and his and, and, and Jesus is the only door into the safety from what's coming. Let's move to the next patriarch, the most classic patriarch that literally defines the term, Abraham. 
Abraham. Now, before he was Abraham, they actually called him Abram, which means father. His, his name was literally dad. So, you know, I'm, I'm so glad, RJ, that you were earlier, you were praying for Iraq because Abraham, Abram, he was an Iraqi. And so, yeah, some of your eyebrows just went up. You're like, wait a second here. No, I think you are suffering from a, a politics in the 20th century and you're losing your, your, your biblical worldview of, of understanding where these things happened in their geographical context. But no, Abraham very much so was an Iraqi. He was from Ur, which is modern day Iraq. And God spoke to Abraham once again. Once again, we have an a listening, obedient man who's spoken to do something that would be considered, uh, you know, strange. You know, you know, Noah was called to build an ark before it had ever rained. That's rather strange. And God tells Abraham, who's older in his age, to, you know, because you know, old old guys want to settle down. They 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 don't want to have to 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 do it all over again and and build houses and dig wells and establish flocks and they don't want they, they old guys want to sit on their front porch and drink their lemonade anybody got any lemonade I'm, that'd be great but god calls abram to leave his land and this is what's crazy about the story it's not what's uh, necessarily the uh the crazy part of the story of him leaving is god says Go to the land that I will show you. I will show you. This means that the promise was conditional upon Abram's listening to God. Write that in your notes. The promise is conditional to Abraham listening to God. Abraham could have turned around. But yet, the Bible from this moment paints Abr Abram as a picture of faith. And usually, I think there's over six references in the New Testament to the faith of Abraham, of Abram. Literally, it, Paul makes the argument that just as Abraham believed, we believe. Just as God considered Abram righteous by faith, in the same way we are considered righteous by faith. It's, it's such an example of the story before the story. But th this continues. A Abram takes his princess, which if you don't know, that, that's Sarah's name. He, he takes her and they go to the land. And they do well and they have to fight and have to have battles. And they're moving all of their flocks. And if you don't know, Abraham was very wealthy. He was very affluent. And yet we, we, see, um, we see the institution of, of, of generosity from the very beginning. Abraham comes onto the scene after a big battle. And there's someone standing there who is a very interesting figure within the biblical narrative. His name is Melchizedek, who the Bible is, uh, is reserves a very interesting th place because it calls him a priest of the Most High God. So we have Melchizedek, a priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek, which means king of righteousness so abraham who's walking in obedience to what god is telling him who, who's in the middle of a battle comes out victorious and is face to face with the king of righteousness who literally the bible says he's the king of salam does anyone want to take a guess on what salam means peace so all of a sudden we have a king of righteousness who's a king of peace, who's a priest of the Most High God, and, and then Abraham offers him a tenth of everything that he just acquired. You know, I'm not, I'm not taking up an offering 
but you just heard a tenth. This is where we get the concept of the tenth from. The priesthood of Melchizedek. From the New Testament, we learn that Melchizedek has no beginning and has no ending. So this is what we call in theology a theophany. Write that down in your notes. It's a big it's a $5 word, Stuart, and you can Venmo me later, but just joking. But theophany is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son. A theophany is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son. These are rare in the Old Testament, but they do happen. And so, you know, these are... People like to get in conflict about these. I never do. I always, I always hold them in a great sense of mystery and wonder. I think that's the appropriate uh, mindset with dealing with theophanies. Because it, the Bible is not categorically clear. But we do know in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I, I just take that for what that is so Abraham is with Melchizedek offering a tenth and uh, and it, it's always the story before the story God promises this man who, who is consequently called father he, called, he promises him a threefold covenant and promise the threefold promise is this, land, seed, and blessing. Write that in your notes, land, seed, and blessing. God promises Abram that his descendants shall have the, from the Tigris Euphrates, Tigris River all the way to the Nile. If you look at the Middle East, that entire section, people are always, always arguing over the borders of Israel and where Israel, where the people of God are. Well, one day God's going to literally say, hey, I told you where the borders were. It's from the Euphrates River to the Nile. And so this is the, the biblical covenant of, that God gave to Abraham. It's what we call the Abrahamic covenant. A covenant is agreement between God and man. And the Abrahamic covenant is what we call an unconditional covenant. There are conditional covenants in the Bible, and then there are unconditional covenants. And the Abrahamic covenant is an, is an unconditional covenant. So land, seed, and blessing are all part of the Abrahamic covenant. Let's look at seed. He says, look at the stars and look at the sand of the ground. As, as the, a great multitude is in the heavens, so shall your descendants be. As, as many as the grains of sand on the seashore, so shall your descendants be. Now this is an incredible promise to give to a very old man who has no children. And then, and then God makes the great missionary blessing. He gives the great missionary blessing through you, all the earth shall be blessed through you all the descendants of the earth shall be blessed so the abrahamic covenant covers land seed and blessing once again the story before the story one day we will be in a new land a promised land one day there will be a multitude that you cannot number an innumerable multitude from every tribe town and nation and one day we will drink from the river that flows from the throne the blessing of blessings land seed and blessing the story before the story so how does God do this how does God secure this great promise well Abraham needs a son so he so and this is unfortunately always the selfish way of a human heart 
is to try to fulfill God's own promises to you. If they could have just been patient, but they weren't. And they tried to force God's hand. So Sarah brings in her, her handmaid, Hagar, and they have Ishmael. And Ishmael is born. And they tried to force God's hand. But you can, you, you can try to force God's hand, but you will never receive the blessing that way. We are to walk in faithful obedience to what God says. Just as Noah walked in faithful obedience. Just as Job walked in faithful obedience. History to this day is still suffering the consequence to that one act of disobedience. God, even although that was not the blessing, God still, he saw Hagar. He still had compassion on her. He still had compassion on Ishmael. When Abraham kicked them out because of disagreements in the family, and Abraham was wrong for kicking her out and shouldn't have kicked her out and should have had compassion and provided for that woman. It says that God saw Hagar. He is the God who sees. But yet God once again confirms his covenant and promise. And even amidst the foolishness of Abraham and Sarah, they give birth to a son. But remember, when the messenger, when the messenger gave the announcement, what did Sarah do? She laughed. And it's so interesting. God goes, okay, you want to laugh? His name shall be laughter. Because Isaac means laughter. So Abraham gave birth to a son, fulfilling the promise. No, excuse me. Abraham's wife, Sarah, gave birth to Isaac. And then they grew up. And the story continues. It goes on. And then we have the time where Isaac is now old -er, Older. And we have an incredible story where now God is going to test Abraham. Because remember, Abraham tried to force it earlier. So God was testing Abraham. This is what we call the Akidah, the great test. God tells Abraham, take your son, your only son. Well, why does he say it like that? Take your son, your only son. He has Ishmael. But yet God uses that story before the story language, which sounds just like John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, only begotten son. So God tells Abraham, take your only son. And Abraham arises early in the morning and goes up the hill. Now it's interesting to find out which hill he goes up. It's called the Mount of Moriah. In the book of 1 Kings, we learn that Salam was built on Mount Moriah. So, this is a hill which of ancient Salam of Moriah, which will one day be the hill of Jerusalem. So literally, to this day, there is a place called uh, in Arabic Al-Aqsa are, are, are the dome and it is they it's Jewish and Christian and Muslim scholars agree this is this is the place where the father of our faith Abraham offered his son Isaac now Muslims will say it's Ishmael but the, the Bible says it was Isaac and Abraham arose early to be obedient to God. And he took the knife. And he was about to bring it down and kill his son. Incredibly tense story. 
But the messenger stops Abram, Abraham and makes a statement. Do you remember what he says? Stop, stop. For now I know that you fear God. Now I know. Now notice he said, now I know that you love God. No. He said, now I know that you fear God. And this is the concept there. If you're going to entrust something so precious. I remember when I was a very young dad. And my son, Liam, was going to go to preschool, like the wee school, like, you know, the two day a week thing. And I, I'm a little paranoid more, more than most, probably because my brother's a, a district attorney and he gets a, uh, a rare window into the horrible parts of humanity. And so I was very reluctant to give my son to anyone. I, I didn't really allow anybody to watch my boy unless I knew them very, very well. But here I am, I'm going to drop my son off for two, two, two days a week for you know, five, six hours a morning. I'm going to drop my, my most precious little Liam off at, a, at, at the school. And so I go there and I, I probably ask the, the weirdest questions that any parent has probably asked at the school. You know, they're, they're probably asking, oh, are their doors locked and are there police and what's the curriculum and do they get to play outside and that kind of things. But I'm looking right at the teacher and asking a different question. And I was not asking, do you love God? That wasn't my question. My question was very simple. Do you fear God? Because I knew that if they feared God, I could entrust them with what was most precious to me. And in the same way, in the same way, God entrusts his blessing to those who fear him. The Bible says the secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him. Angels encamp around those who fear him. God shall show his covenant and law to those who fear him. He looks to those who tremble at his word. The, at the end of time, folks, at the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, when the great angel goes around the whole world and makes all of our missionary efforts look weak and pales in comparison, that angel will make a great statement preaching the everlasting gospel. And he will say, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. The fear of the Lord is not something that's separate and distinct from the promise. It's part of the promise. It's the precursor to the promise. It's the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, and the beginning of understanding. And you can't have genuine intimacy and friendship with God apart from holding that relationship with holy fear. So Abraham feared God. And then on the mountain, God provided a substitute. For he looked and there was a ram caught in a thorn bush. Did you catch that? The lamb is in, the ram, the male ram is entangled in the curse of sin. For thorns are symbolic in the Bible of sin. Because they come forth from the curse, God says. The ground shall bear thorns and thistles for you. Cursed is the ground for you, your sake, he says in, in, in the Torah in Genesis. And so we have the lamb in the thorn bush. But then Abraham makes a statement. In the mountain of the Lord, God has provided. In the mountain of the Lord, God has provided and what God provided as a lamb as a foreshadowing a thousand years later God sent forth the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world entangled in sin entangled in your sin and in mine and he says he takes away the sin of the whole world Paul tells us that 
He who knew no sin became like a sin offering, like sin to us, as treated as sin, that he would reconcile the world unto himself. The godly for the ungodly, the righteous for the unrighteous. Same mountain, same story. God tells the story before the story. That through the atonement, man can be at one with God again. This continues. We have now Isaac, who's not dead, who's now alive. And through this life, he seeks a bride. He's not dead, he's now, uh, now alive, and he seeks a bride. And then Abraham does something so unique. He sends a helper to the place of his land, to the place of his birth, Eliezer. Abraham, the father, sends Eliezer to get a bride for his son. And Eliezer, that name means helper. So the father sends the helper to get the bride for the son. It is the story before the story. Abraham sends Eliezer to get the bride with a price being paid for the bride to the son. Notice also, and I'm indebted to the work of Arthur W. Pink and his gleanings in Genesis, that Isaac never commits one fault or one sin in all of the Torah. He's perfect. He's a type and foreshadowing of Jesus. The son has no fault in him, the son of the father. So it's a foreshadowing, a foreshadowing of Christ himself. And if you would like to know more, I recommend the book Gleanings of Genesis by A.W. Pink. You'll be able to find that book. So Isaac has many, has two sons, two nations warring in the womb. Isaac's wife has two boys, Jacob and Esau. Now this story is so rich with so many details. We have the son, we have the son of the promise and then we have a man who wants to do it his own way and you think it's one or the other but it's this incredible hybrid between the two both Esau and Jacob are wrong so many times but for polar opposite reasons Esau is always on the outside. He's always hunting, providing for himself. And then Jacob's always in the tent, wimpy, namby, pamby, being catered to and pandering. So we have these two polar extremes. We have like the alpha male, and then we have like the, I don't know, what's the, what's the other equivalent? I want to be really respectful here, but we have the effeminate. The alpha and the effeminate. We have, you know, Jacob, he likes to be inside. He doesn't like hard work. And, and you know, Esau is like Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. And, and so these, and yet we have Jacob who wants to bless these sons. He wants to bless his boys with the blessing, which, which came from Abraham. That blessing he wants to give to his sons. But his sons... Jacob desperately wants the blessing for himself and wants to go by his own means to acquire it. And Esau is completely indifferent to the blessing. He doesn't want it. He doesn't care. He literally trades his brother the blessing of God for a bowl of stew. Like, I don't care how good the beef and hearty stew is. You don't trade. See, it's just the insanity of, of trading eternity and eternal blessing and heritage and legacy for something physical for something temporal for only that's not going to last in a fleeting moment hopefully this is speaking to some of you never trade your birthright and your legacy and your identity for something so quick something so temporal that will never ultimately satisfy you that's the lesson and then we have jacob 
whose name means deceiver, by the way, trying to deceive his father to obtain the blessing. And then he puts animal skins on his arms. He puts animal skins on his arms so that he would look like his brother. So he's not really who he's supposed to be. He's pretending to be some. He's pretending and acting like something else so that he might obtain the blessing. He's trying to, to trick his father about his identity. This is very, very important because religious people do this all the time, but in different ways. They say, oh, God, you can't really see me because I'm wearing I'm wearing the skins of another. I, I, I'm really I'm really like him. But inwardly. I'm a Jacob. And the father speaks. He says an incredible thing. He goes, you, you feel like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. The father is always able to see through the deception. And yet, God, the father blesses. Esau and Jacob separate. Esau feels hurt and betrayed and isolates himself. They both grow in power. They both grow in flocks. But Jacob knows that on his great return, coming back to meet his brother in the wilderness, he knows that he's in trouble. He knows that he's going to probably die, that Esau is going to kill him. But he had learned something from his father. And he takes stones. And in his sorrow and in his remorse, he builds an altar and stacks stones. And he pours out the precious symbol of the promise, oil, on the rock. He gave a tenth of everything that he had as a sacrifice to God. Take, I want to be obedient. This is what my father taught me. I want to, I, you see, we see Jacob's heart starting to turn. He stacks the stones in sorrow. He pours the oil out. He gives the tenth. His brother's approaching on the hill. And then all of a sudden, we have a messenger there. You see, he, he made a step towards God. And all of a sudden, whether it was the angel of the Lord, whether it was Jesus, the, the, we don't know. The Bible does say he wrestled with an angel. But all night, all night long, they wrestle. They wrestle. Jacob wrestles with God. And Jacob is wrestling, trying to wrestle for the blessing. I won't let you go until you bless me. I won't let you go until you bless me. And then the messenger says, what is your name? Speaking of his identity. He had to recognize who he was, that he was Jacob, the deceiver. When he recognized who he was, the messenger says, you are Israel, the prince of God. One who struggles with God. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Of God we will never enter the kingdom unless we know how broken and desperate we are God I've sinned I'm guilty help me and that humility and that contriteness the Bible says that a broken and contrite spirit God will not despise he looks to the contrite. His eye is upon the mourner. And Jesus says the entrance into the kingdom. Now we don't stay that way. We don't have to stay that way. We're liberated and free. But we enter in through godly sorrow and repentance. And this is what Jacob did. He recognized who he was. He recognized that he had lived a life of deception. He lied to his family. He lied to his father. He lied to his brother. And when he recognized it and admitted it, then God gave him a new name and a new identity. And he moves from deception into being a prince. It is the story 
before the story. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us. Let's pray. And then let's pray. Jesus. Lord, we want to be like these great men of old who were written as examples for us. We thank you, God, that these stories were recorded. And we see so much of our life and our story in their stories. Lord, we pray that we could be encouraged by their faith. Encouraged by their, by their faith, but warned from their weaknesses. Help us, God, to learn from their mistakes and walk in loving, trusting, fearful obedience of, of who you are and the majesty of who you are. Thank you for being our King of Righteousness. Amen.